The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hands in his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Amen. We call him Doubting Thomas, but we could call him Honest Thomas. Thomas had honest doubts and didn't hesitate to express them honestly. The other disciples had been as certain as Thomas that their hopes had come to an end with the death of Jesus. Our scripture reading tells us that on Easter evening, they had locked themselves in the house for fear of the Jews. They had seen Jesus crucified and were afraid that they, as his disciples, might be next. We might be surprised to see the disciples so fearful. Peter and another disciple have seen the empty tomb. And Mary Magdalene has seen the risen Christ. And Mary told the disciples that Jesus was alive. By this time on Easter evening, the disciples should have been celebrating in the streets, but were instead locked in a secret room because they were afraid. Now we can understand them being afraid after the crucifixion, but it seems surprising that they were still afraid after the resurrection. But then they had only the testimony of two disciples that the tomb was empty and that the testimony of one woman that she had seen Jesus. So what if the tomb were empty? That could mean anything. It didn't necessarily mean that Jesus was alive. And what if a woman said that she had seen Jesus alive? In that time and place, a woman's word didn't amount to much. A woman seeing a crime wasn't even allowed to serve as a witness in court. These men must have discounted Mary's testimony that she had seen Jesus alive. Jesus was dead and buried and they all knew it. But then Jesus came through the locked door, came into their locked room, entered their fear-filled prison, and said, Peace be to you. And the fear drained from their faces to be replaced by incredulity, and then by joy. Mary was telling the truth after all. It was one thing to hear her tell that Jesus was alive, 
but it was another thing to see him in the flesh. But Thomas wasn't with them. At this point, there were only 11 apostles because Judas was dead. And then there were only 10 because Thomas was missing. So the 10 disciples told Thomas, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. I will not believe. That's why we call him Doubting Thomas. But we could call him Honest Thomas because he's simply expressing honest reservation about Jesus being alive. After all, when a person dies, that's it. You can be injured and come back. You can get sick and come back. You can be in a coma and come back but you don't die and come back. That just doesn't happen. If we're honest, we'll have to admit that had we been in Thomas's shoes that day, we would have had trouble too. So instead of calling Doubting Thomas, maybe we should put a more positive spin on things and call him Honest Thomas. That is certainly how we would want people to treat the story if we were the doubters. And we have all been doubters at one time or another, haven't we? Doubting Thomas, honest Thomas. We might even think of him as courageous Thomas because it takes courage to be the lone dissenter, courage to stand up and be counted when there are 10 of them and only one of you. Courage to stick with unpopular doubt in the face of popular opinion. Thomas did that. He stuck by his guns. So we can call him Doubting, Doubting Thomas, or Honest Thomas, or Courageous Thomas, but that wasn't the end of the story. Doubting Thomas became Believing Thomas. When Jesus came to visit again, this time Thomas was present. Earlier, Thomas had said that he would have to see the wounds in Jesus' hands and side, that he would have to touch the wounds to make sure that they were real. And when Jesus came back for a second visit, he told Thomas, reach here your finger and see my hands. Reach here your hand and put it into my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. In other words, Thomas had specified what he would require to believe. And when Jesus came to the disciples a second time, he offered Thomas exactly what Thomas had required. See my hands, put your hand in the wound in my side. He gave Thomas exactly what Thomas needed. Thomas responded, my Lord and my God. In this Gospel of John, nobody says it better. Thomas did more than to say, my Lord and my God. The Bible doesn't tell us what happened to Thomas after that day, but we think that he took the Gospel to India. Doubting Thomas became believing Thomas, and belief changed his life. The man who had been depressed and unbelieving became a pillar of faith. That was true for all of the disciples. One glimpse of the risen Lord transformed all of them because it proved that they had been right to believe in Jesus. It proved that there was no difficulty too great for Jesus. It showed them they had no need to be afraid, and they weren't. They weren't afraid anymore. Now the disciples were faith-filled, ready to face a hostile world with the good news of Jesus' resurrection. They had seen him. They knew what they were talking about. I like the story of the doubting disciples. I like it because I'm a doubter too. When things are going well, I'm tempted to doubt that I need Jesus. Then when things are going badly, I'm tempted to believe that Jesus has let me down. I'm always in danger bouncing between those two poles, either doubting that I need Jesus or believing that he has let me down. But Jesus always tries to help me out of that miserable place. Jesus never stops trying to coax me out of that dark hole into the light. Then Thomas had trouble believing. Jesus came to him. Jesus said, reach here your finger and see my hands. Reach here your hand and put it into my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. 
In other words, Jesus came to this man who was having trouble believing and gave him what he needed so he could believe. Jesus does for me too. He comes to me. He gives me what I need so I can believe. Jesus helps me past my unbelief. Sometimes I'm slow to move out of my dark hole. Sometimes when things are going badly, I wonder where God is. Sometimes when I read the newspaper, I wonder why God allows so much evil in the world. And sometimes when I see the kind of people that get rich, I wonder if there's any justice. Sometimes I get angry with God and want to stay in my dark hole. But Jesus never stops trying to coax me into the light. Jesus never fails to give me what I need so that I can believe. At that point, it's up to me. The ball's in my court. I can doubt or I can believe. Jesus always leaves me that choice. He never forces me, but Jesus always does his part. He always gives me what I need so that I can believe if I will. Some people would say that a preacher should never admit doubt, but I confess my struggles with doubt and my temptation to stay in dark places because I know that those are common experiences. Most of us experience doubt at some point, especially when we're young. When we're young, we have so many unanswered questions. We don't know where life will take us. We don't know if we will amount to anything. We don't know whether our lives will go well or badly. We're tempted to despair, tempted to doubt, tempted not to believe. But I share with you my own struggles because I want you to know that in the end, Jesus has always helped me to believe, has given me what I needed, has helped me out of the dark place. Just as Jesus gave Thomas what Thomas needed, so Jesus gives me what I need. I share this with you because I know that many of you struggle with the social distancing and the effects of the coronavirus. You may be in a dark place right now and held up there. I share my story with you because I want you to know that doubt and darkness need to be the end, don't need to be the end of your story. Jesus is always there for us, always trying to help always offering us what we need so that we can believe. At that point, it is up to us. We can choose doubt, we can choose darkness, or we can choose to join Jesus in the light. It isn't much fun to sit in the solitude of the dark place. It is far happier to come out into the light of belief. At first, the light can seem too bright, dazzling, it can hurt our eyes, but once we adjust to living in the light, we will not be able to imagine why we were ever wanted to stay in the dark place. Jesus told Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Blessed, blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. That is us. We have not seen Jesus in the flesh, but we have believed. Some people call this Jesus' last beatitude. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. I have told you about Thomas's doubt and his belief. I have told you about my struggle with doubt. I have told you that Jesus has always been there for me, has always helped me through my doubt, has always helped me to believe. Jesus has always given me a choice. He has allowed me freedom to hide in darkness, but has always encouraged me to come to the light. He has given me the freedom to doubt, but has given me what I needed so I could believe. Let me close by telling you that in believing, I have been blessed. The life of the believer is ever so much happier than the life of a doubter. I have been both, I know. Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Amen.